Hello, and welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring. Before we start the crime, let's talk about the coloring. I have selected a Mama Elephant stamp set. I think this was last year's Mother's Day release or something like that. And I also have a piece of Bristol Smooth um, cardstock. I am going to be using some watercolor markers today and um, apparently this is the cardstock to use if you're going to be using your Zig Clean Color Real Brush markers. Um, they are not my color medium of choice because I'm not very good at it, but I won't get any better at it if I don't use them, right? So I'm going to be using some watercolor markers today. These are super sweet, um, easy to color, not too small, not too big, um, stamped images, and that's why I chose them for the coloring today. Um, I will be inking these up with Versafa um, let's see, Versafine, Versaclair, Nocturne Black ink. This ink is waterproof, so it is perfectly suitable for watercolor mediums. I am going to leave that cardstock in my Misty Stamp Positioner so that I can overstamp the images once I'm done and use my Brother Scan and Cut to cut the images out. If you would like to see a video where I use my Brother Scan and Cut to cut out stamped images, leave me a comment down below. 100% I would be happy to do that. This is the little pouch I keep my Zig markers in. I found this on Amazon. It came in a set of three. Super cool. Love it so much. I have the 24 set of Zig Clean Color Real Brush Markers. I will be using the browns and the grays in my set. Um, I'm going to do a brown bear and a brown deer and a black koala and a black bunny. Okay, so now that the coloring is underway, let me start by saying, first of all, I am going to attempt to color darkest to lightest, putting the darkest color into the shadows and pulling it out with a lighter color or a clear blender pen um, because they are watercolor pens or markers. They are um, very fluid when they are wet. So I'm coloring in small sections at a time. Okay, so now let's talk about our story. We are currently in the fourth alphabetical state in the United States, Arkansas. Arkansas was admitted to the United States, granted statehood, on June 15, 1836, and our story takes place in 1845. Now, this is an interesting story in that it is short, and it is short because there is an absurd lack of detailed information. I do not have a picture of our murderers. I do not have a picture of our victim. I could not find birth records, death records, parental links, and even grave sites or tombstones for any of the characters involved. Characters, people, whatever. However, I found it to be quite an interesting story and what little information there was intrigued me. So I opted to go with this story anyway. So let's set the scene just a little bit. Lying on a low hill just east of the National Cemetery in South Fayetteville, Arkansas, about one mile from the county jail that is at the town square, is the location of the first execution of an Arkansas woman. The fall of 1845 saw a flurry of activity there to build a scaffold for a hanging for a murderer that occurred in August 1845, the first legal execution of the state. Its position served well in accommodating large crowds of observers anxious to watch the hanging. This later became known as Gallows Hill. After the Civil War in 1867, the site was taken over by the federal government and became part of the National Cemetery. See, so now you know why I was intrigued. Not only is it the first execution since Arkansas became a state, the first official execution since Arkansas became a state, it is the first execution of a woman in Arkansas statehood. Crawford Burnett was born about 1785 in Hanover County, Virginia, to John and Elizabeth Tate, or John Burnett and Elizabeth Tate. I couldn't find much about his life at all, except that there is a marriage record to a woman named Lavinia May Sharp on the 29th of December, 1810, in Patrick County, Virginia, and her marriage license lists her 
or the marriage certificate lists her as having been born in about 1785 as well. I haven't found any records of her birthplace or even her parents' names. Crawford and Lavinia were the parents to at least two children, John born about 1811 and Minerva born about 1820. Sometime after Minerva was born, they left Virginia and moved to Trigg County, Kentucky, and lived in the home of Crawford's brother, Cornelius. Later, Lavinia and Crawford settled eventually into Arkansas. On August 12, 1845, a reclusive bachelor living in Fayetteville named either Jonathan Sibley or Jonathan Sebley, Selby, okay, two names, same person, was killed and, as, and suspicion almost immediately fell on the Burnetts. Not sure why. It was rumored that Jonathan hoarded his wealth in his remote cabin. He paid cash for 80 acres, which probably contributed to the idea that he was wealthy. Um, he also purchased livestock and building materials for his home and outbuildings and fences. Later court testimony revealed that he had made the mistake of allowing someone to see him place a quantity of money into his wallet. So let's pause there for a minute. The man's dead and on during the trial or in a court hearing, he is blamed for putting his own money in his own wallet, which attracted killers, which, you know, okay, be a little sly, right? But Dude, talk about victim shaming. My goodness. Why suspicion fell on Crawford and Lavinia Burnett and their son John is not known. Crawford and Lavinia were jailed, but, this, but their son John left for Missouri and could not be found. After their arrest, their 15-year-old daughter Minerva and Hardin Sharp, he's either Lavinia's brother or cousin, confessed to the authorities that their family had planned Selby's murder, but John, the son of Lavinia and Crawford, had actually carried out the killing. Okay, crazy. October 3rd, the sheriff was ordered by the judge to summon 38 men for a grand jury. The grand jury was impaneled without wasting any time, and after testimony, the men were sent to deliberate. Before noon, before noon, the foreman of the grand jury reported that the jurors had indicted Crawford and Lavinia Burnett on a charge of murder in the death of Jonathan Selby. The following day, Saturday, October 4th, Saturday, it's a Saturday, they were tried at a special term. Both defendants pled not guilty and asked for a trial by jury. The judge ordered the sheriff to secure a jury panel and released Minerva Burnett, their daughter, until Monday, October 6th, under a $100 bond. $1845, $100 is big money. A second witness, or the second witness, Hardin Sharp, was freed under a similar bond. On Monday morning, court convened and Crawford and Lavinia were set to be tried separately. Mm -hmm. The prosecution was assigned, and the judge assigned defense attorneys to the Burnets. A third Fayetteville lawyer volunteered to aid in the defense. On Wednesday, a jury was, a jury was assembled to hear the case against Crawford. Prior to the trial starting, Crawford's attorney motioned to be dismissed as his lawyer. Crawford probably not guilty of the murder himself, refused to testify against his wife. So the judge granted the motion and that third volunteer lawyer stepped in to be his attorney. Um, Minerva and Hardin were the witnesses against their family and the trial was quick. The jury on the same day found Crawford guilty of first degree murder largely due to his own daughter's testimony. The following day, Thursday, Lavinia went on trial. Minerva again testified that she had heard her parents plotting the death of Jonathan Selby with her brother, John. During Lavinia's trial, 
a motion to omit the testimony of Hardin Sharp, Lavinia's brother or cousin, whatever his relation was, was presented by her attorney and denied. The reason that Lavinia's attorney wanted the testimony of Hardin thrown out was because he believed Hardin was an accomplice to the murder. Just as it had been the day before in her husband's trial, Lavinia's trial was quick and the jury deliberated briefly before returning a guilty verdict. So the next Tuesday, October 10th, the judge pronounced sentence on the two defendants, ordering them to be taken to the common gallows and hanged by the neck until dead. They were sentenced to be hung on November 8th, 1845, less than 30 days after the trial, which is why they were in a fury building these gallows. The gallows were erected on the hill south of town. The court had ordered that the sentence be carried out between noon and 3 p.m. A large crowd had gathered some time before the execution, and it appeared by, by written accounts that almost every person in the county who was able to reach Fayetteville the day on that day was on hand by the time of the executions. And there, in the presence of almost the entire county, Crawford and Lavinia Burnett were executed. Soon after their execution, their son John was arrested in Missouri and returned to Arkansas. Young Burnett, or John Burnett, was indicted by a grand jury on December 1st, and efforts to select a jury began the following day. Although no record of the proceedings was kept in those days, the bar record of court proceedings indicates that the Burnett attorneys put up a fight. The lawyers appear to have believed in the innocence of their client, John, but the testimony of his sister, Minerva, convinced the jury that John was guilty, and on December 26, the day after Christmas, John was led to the gallows where his parents had died and was hanged by the neck until dead. Lavinia was the first woman legally executed in Arkansas and the only woman executed in Arkansas for 165 years until the year 2000. There is no record of anywhere of any of the Burnett's where any of the Burnett's were buried. It is um, thought that they were buried in Potter's Field, not too far from the site of the hanging. So I found this interesting because in this time, it was still considered um, relatively impossible for a woman to be a criminal unless she was mentally insane, in which case she was sent to live in an asylum until she was, quote, healthy enough to be released. So it was interesting that Lavinia was actually hung for her crimes. Minerva Burnett is said to have moved to Texas, where she married a man named Jonas W. Williams about two years after the execution of her parents and brother. Hardin Sharp has, is, is said to have moved to Missouri and married Lucinda Beck and lived out his life in the communities of Benton and Job, Missouri. The case, the testimony of the case, was reviewed by many well-known and highly influential attorneys after the death of the three Burnett's. And here's the, here's the shocker. And it was general consensus that the daughter Minerva lied about her parents and brother out of revenge. Okay. What in the world did they do to this girl that she was so mad that she lied about them killing another human being? And how did she get her uncle slash cousin involved in this as well? If that is true and Minerva was able to get her entire family convicted and executed, she is a wicked, wicked woman and I do not want to be on her bad side. As I said at the beginning of the video, I could not find photographs of the Burnett family or Jonathan Selby, but I did find an artist sketch of the Fayetteville, Arkansas area about the time of the murder and the hangings. So let me know. Give me a, leave me a comment down below. How do you feel about that unsettled ending? I don't know. It leaves me a little bit on edge. Thanks for stopping by today. I have a couple other videos here for you to watch as well as a subscribe button. If you have not already subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did so. And as always, 
I hope you have a really, really great day.